Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the premiere of The Innovators. I'm Fred Martino. Today on the program, Dr. Don Cleveland. He completed his undergraduate work at New Mexico State University before his graduate studies at Princeton. Dr. Cleveland received a 2018 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. Each breakthrough is $3 million, the largest individual monetary prize in science. The prizes were established by some of the nation's leading business people, including Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg. Dr. Cleveland was honored in part for his work that is helping us to better understand an inherited form of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Before the award ceremony, he talked about his work in the KRWG studios and took questions from New Mexico State University students. Thanks for the opportunity to visit uh, New Mexico State University. As, you, as Fred has in indicated, it's my alma mater and I've, I take great pleasure in being here. I want to describe today the development of designer DNA drugs for therapy for human nervous system disease, especially diseases of aging. We, we began this approach now 14 years ago to use little pieces of DNA you may remember DNA is the, is the substance that make up our genes, and using little pieces of that infused into the nervous system, we've d discovered how to silence individual genes and to do so broadly throughout the human nervous system. And why would we want to do that? The genetics of human disease has taught us that the level of expression of specific genes is crucial to driving age-dependent disease especially the, the two biggest diseases of the nervous system, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. What, what the community of geneticists have learned is that if you inherit three copies instead of two copies of either of two genes, you will get early onset Alzheimer's disease for inheriting one of those genes, an additional copy of one of those genes, and you'll it, develop early onset Parkinson's disease if you inherit an extra copy of the other of those two genes. The, so dosage matters. And so a, an on disease therapy would be to lower the dosage of those genes throughout the human nervous system. We started this in the disease that the Americans call Lou Gehrig's disease, or more properly, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, a disease in which the neurons that hook up to the muscles degenerate prematurely and thereby leaving the patient uh, paralyzed with a progressive fatal paralysis. With the discovery of a gene whose mutation is causative of ALS, we set out to try to silence that gene in the nervous system and show that when we did that, in animal examples of inherited ALS, that applying the therapeutic approach at the, at the time of symptom onset, that we could delay disease advance uh, very substantially. That led to the first in man trial, uh, a clinical trial, to test efficacy in true human ALS, a trial that's now ongoing. Additionally, uh, for uh, another disease of the nervous system, one in which all instances are caused by inheritance of a mutation in the same gene, the disease is called Huntington's disease. If you inherit one bad gene, you will get Huntington's disease developing typically by age 40 or 50 and invariably fatal over a, a time course of a decade or a decade and a half. We demonstrated that we could get, with single dose injection of a designer DNA drug to silence the disease causing gene, that we could get disease reversal, partial disease reversal in animal models. And that too has now gone to human trial with the outcome of the trial to be announced at the first of the year in 2018. Additionally, in that work, we recognized something amazing about these designer DNA drugs. 
And that is that when you inject them into the fluid that bathes the brain and the spinal cord, that they get taken up by cells throughout the nervous system and they work for a very long time. You probably remember that if you take an aspirin, you get three or four hours worth of relief. But with these designer DNA drugs uh, today, you get not three or four hours, not three or four days, not three or four weeks, but three or four months of silencing the target gene. That's now enabled this strategy broadly by uh, dosing uh, in individuals only periodically, three or four times a year, to silence the disease-causing genes. We're about to move uh, into the biggest disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is in, in which there are two primary things that go wrong. First, there's an accumulation of an extracellular piece of a protein called, that assembles apparently into structures called plaques. And there's an intracellular protein named tau, which misassembles and forms tangles inside the affected neurons. And indeed, the misassembly of tau, a protein that I discovered <laughs> and, uh, in 1977, that, that, that intracellular misaccumulation is the best uh, hallmark of the cognitive dis uh, decline that is the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. And just last uh, October, uh, using a gene silencing approach to silence that gene tau, went to clinical trial, partnered by uh, my, my corporate partner, uh, Ionis Pharmaceuticals, and with a big pharmaceutical partner, Biogen, that went to trial in Alzheimer's disease. And now, lastly, you're probably familiar with uh, a disease uh, now, now prominently uh, found in the, Na the National Football League, this chronic brain injury, where focal injury appears to spread very slowly from cell to cell. And the hallmark of that disease is the misaccumulation, misfolding and misaccumulation of the protein tau that I mentioned earlier. So my prediction in, for the future is that we can treat National Football League disease by lowering the synthesis of tau in affected individuals using one of these designer DNA drugs. The, this approach has also been used not just to silence genes, to but, but to modify the way in which gene information is, flows from the gene to its intermediate, called an RNA, to the final product, the protein. And that su a success in doing that in the, has been achieved in the most abundant, or one of the most abundant genetic diseases of children. It's called spinal muscular atrophy, where the affected kids uh, typically die from fatal paralysis by age one. And FDA approved the approach last December, and now after dosing 400 individuals, we have kids, instead of dying at age one, we have kids that are walking. This is the first success of this designer DNA ap approach, but I predict that there will be many more as we go forward. And indeed, for the last of these, there's the disease Parkinson's disease, a disease that's very personal to me. Uh, my father, who was on the faculty of this university, died from that disease, and I saw all of the symptoms up close and personal. We recognize that if you inherit three copies of a gene called alpha-synuclein, you will get early onset Parkinson's disease, and most Parkinson's patients accumulate aberrant deposits of alpha-synuclein. So the approach which I predict will go to trial in 2018 or 2019 will be to, uh, to attempt a therapy in Parkinson's disease by lowering the synthesis of the alpha-synuclein gene. So my, I, I've given you a 14-year report of the development of designer DNA drugs for treatment of nervous system disorders, uh, uh, especially those of aging. And my prediction is that the, with, with the initial success in the childhood disease, spinal muscular atrophy, that there will be, other, that there will be uh, additional successes and that the approach can be used even more broadly for nervous system disease. Dr. John Cleveland of the University of California at San Diego. Dr. Cleveland, it is so great to have you My here. My pleasure to be today. here. We met some months ago when you visited New Mexico State, and I know you're very excited to be back 
uh, here again and we're going to hear from some students at New Mexico State who are going to have questions for you about your work. I'm, all, I'm all, always glad to ask questions, always glad to be back at New Mexico State. Well, it is wonderful to have you here. And as we continue this discussion, it's such an important topic. You know, as I was listening to you talk about uh, your research and how this is advanced, one of the things that struck me uh, was the fact that when you talked about the protein tau that you discovered, I believe you said 1977, was that right? 1977, yeah. yes. It is a reminder to our audience and to the students who are going to come to the mic with their questions that science sometimes takes decades to use incredibly important uh, information. This uh, discovery that you made now is at this point where we are now being able to use this information to potentially save people from terrible diseases, Alzheimer's, injuries, tra traumatic brain injury. You mentioned the NFL. That yes. was one way where we have uh, TBI. Uh, but I, I imagine back in 1977, when you discovered this, uh, it would have been hard to imagine all of the possibilities <laughs> yes. that this would lead to. Yeah, so I, as a, I was a, an undergraduate here at, at uh, New Mexico State, and I was in physics, and then I went off to graduate school in, uh, uh, initially in physics, but then I switched into biochemistry, and I purified uh, a, a protein tau, which was the first so a protein called a microtubule associated protein and we had no re we had no idea that it was now going to be, that it would ultimately be recognized to be centrally involved in multiple diseases uh, of the human nervous system but the basic science discovery which the phd's do it, it are the enabling discoveries uh, almost always in uh, making major medical advances how gratifying is that to think that uh, your discovery now could lead to literally uh, life-changing impact for people. Well, I'm, I admit I'm, an, I'm a hopeless optimist, mm -hmm. and uh, I have I presented it, uh, an optimistic uh, picture today, and you've just uh, made it even more optimistic. But I, I, actually, I do think uh, the, that we, since we've demonstrated that we can affect disease course in examples of, of disease in animals and because we now have one proven success in spinal muscular atrophy, this disease of children, I think we have a very credible chance of changing disease course for multiple neurodegenerative diseases. Whether it will be good enough, uh, that, nothing will, no single therapy will be good enough, but today it, the truth is that for the di diseases that I describe, there really is nothing that affects the, the rate of disease progression. Uh, so this has a chance if, if, we d if we can get the correct doses and if we can get to enough of the right cells, it really, it, it's, very, it's somewhere between plausible and uh, likely, for the real optimists, likely that we'll have, have an effect in multiple diseases. Okay. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me, another thing that in your discussion is you're, you mentioned the fact that with certain diseases, Hunting, Huntington's disease was yeah. one, when a genetic test is done, we can actually know if someone will develop the disease. This is very important and an incredibly interesting discovery. I mean, a lot of times when we talk about genetic testing, we talk about uh, an increased risk yes. of developing a disease. But you also point out that sometimes we know for sure based on the genetic test. Yes, we know, we know for sure in Huntington's that you're, you're virtually certain to get the disease if you inherit the specific mutation. We know that's true for some mutations for a small fraction of patients in Alzheimer's disease, for small fractions of Parkinson's patients. We know it's true for about 10 to 15 percent of ALS patients that you inherit the, a gene whose mutation is going to cause the disease. And for those, for in all of those instances, if you knew that, and if you knew that you had a therapy that could really affect disease, yeah, you would want to, you'd want to 
to apply that therapy as early as possible. Yeah. Today, has, today in, in the United States, many patients choose not to be tested, in part because there aren't effective therapies, and in part because of the complexities of the American healthcare system. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about that. So I've read individual stories, actual stories of people who have made that decision, who've said, I don't want to know. Yeah. I really don't want to know. On the flip side, choice is so important and and people do want to know they may want to do things in their lives yeah. knowing yeah. that they may not have much time yeah so all I think all of us who are in that business we all we completely agree that individuals should have choice but they should have they also all of them should should first talk to genetic counselors to make sure they've considered all of the issues uh, some of which are not quite as obvious about what the consequences of knowing or not knowing are. And then it's a, it's a truly individualistic decision. In the United States, uh, for most of these, uh, these uh, uh, diseases, the, pay, uh, the, the, pop, the people choose not to know. In some uh, countries in Europe, they do, uh, most of the pa patients or uh, people at risk choose to know. So these are very individualistic choices. And again, I, I, absolutely, I would counsel everybody who is at, is at risk or has one of these diseases in the family, talk to genetic counselors and then make your own choice. Yeah. We again welcome our students from New Mexico State University to come up to the microphone with their questions. One of the exciting things about doing a program like this is that opportunity for exchange with students. And this, I know, is particularly meaningful to you, Dr. Cleveland, because you started your career in science here at New Mexico State University. And if you could say your name before your question. Yeah, so my name is Pablo, and um, I have a question about what advice would you give um, undergraduate students from NMSU that want to go to the top schools? Okay, so what advice do I give to New Mexico State undergraduates about uh, how to get into or whether they want to get into the top schools for graduate school or for medical school? Um, Is that the? Medical school, do you? Yeah. And so the f I, I, would, I would absolutely give them, uh, every, every one of those students, I would give them the advice, don't sell yourself short. I remember being a very unconfident uh, uh, student at New Mexico State, unsure about how well I could compete uh, with, uh, with those from the elite universities. And I have to say, I went to graduate school at Princeton, and there were four students in my graduate's class who have become top tier in the American science. One of them has won the National Medal of Science, uh, three of them are in the National Academy of Science, and one became the, the CEO of America's most successful biotech company, Genentech, and he's chairman of the board of Apple. And all four of those students had one thing in common. We all came from America's public universities. And there were not the topmost tier of those public universities. So be confident. You do have the skills to, to, to move forward. This faculty has given you skills, a skill set that can allow you to achieve. Don't be shy about saying that. Great advice. As an Aggie alum, uh, I, I share in giving that advice. It is so exciting uh, to have uh, wonderful students here who have wonderful questions about uh, their future and the future of science. We have another uh, student, if you could give your name and, and your question. Hi, yes, my name is Priscilla. Uh, going a little bit back into your research, I want to know what you see the future of uh, designer drugs coming to people that already have the disease. Yeah, so you've asked one of the, the most crucial questions in uh, designing clinical trials and in biomedical research. When do you apply the therapy and when, when is too late? And so the, uh, uh, the, what one has to do uh, to get to, to demonstrate efficacy of a drug approach, you must show that you can slow disease advance. And so we must start with individuals who already have disease. And we hope that we will be effective 
we know that we might be starting too late for some. And in the disease, of the childhood disease, spinal muscular atrophy, we've de that's now been demonstrated that it, the, if you, the later you start therapy, the more moderate the benefit. So treating those kids as early as possible has produced kids who now can walk and maybe they can have normal lives. So it's one of the, the, the crucial parts and we, we don't have an unambiguous answer to that. We're, we're always designing to try to get to patients as early in disease course as possible. And, and I, our examples uh, so far, especially in Huntington's disease, is by treating uh, animals that, that have been engineered to have Huntington's disease, that we can see disease, disease reversal, partial disease reversal. So that's given us uh, a very uplifting uh, point that, may, that we really might be able to help patients even already after uh, uh, substantial disease. And so, Dr. Cleveland, as I understand it, some of these uh, designer DNA drugs may uh, not only prevent the onset of the disease, but if someone already has the disease, it may lessen the symptoms. That's oh, the hope. So, absolutely. So, what we do in um, what we're in all of the trials now, we're, we're, we're treating people who already are showing symptoms of disease. So, and that's and a, the reason for that is that is a, a because the easier. It, oh, no, because it's the, absolutely the only way you can do it because the age of disease onset, even in these inherited examples of disease, is highly variable. So you can't, if you take an individual who's unaffected, you can't be sure you actually slowed the disease onset unless you treated them for a very long time. And so we, what the ideal trial would be to treat individuals who have early stage disease and ask, can you slow it from progressing? Okay, in the best of cases, can you reverse disease? As we've achieved in the Huntington examples, in, in, uh, in animal examples. So, uh, but we, we, everyone would be just so pleased if we could slow disease advance. That would be, uh, that, that would be a fantastic outcome. And I'm hopeful that we will see at least a piece of that and when the outcome of the Huntington trial is announced uh, early next year. Okay, very good. We have another question. Hi, my name's Andrew, and I had a question about the drugs and trial. Yeah. Are there any off-target effects, or if so, what are they? Okay, so are there off-target effects? Always there are off-target effects. Uh, you use any kind of chemical, any kind of drug, there are potential off-target effects. With the gene silencing approach that we use, we use short designer DNA drugs where we know that the only sequence they match in the human genome is the gene that we're targeting. So we don't think that there are any specific off-target effects. We don't anticipate any of those, but it's a drug, and so there might be other off-target effects. Yes, uh, is every drug toxic at a high enough dose? Of course it is. So we screen them for lowest toxicity, highest efficacy, but uh, the, then, then you go to tr the true human trial. We know in two trials, one in children and one in adults, that the drugs that we chose are safe. We know that they do hit the genes that we are aiming at. And so we're cautiously optimistic that the off-target effects will not, be, uh, will not be severe. This, of course, one of the most difficult things, I guess, in doing clinical trials, knowing that there is a chance with some of these drugs that there may be effects that were not intended. Uh, and something that, that's very important to understand. Again, getting to this point of science takes time and uh, sometimes decades. Yeah, so uh, one example which I, uh, I might have included in my comments at the beginning was that the, the largest cause of ALS and the, turns out to be also the largest cause of the second most frequent dementia called frontal temporal dementia. And that, that gene, the mutation in it, was identified in September of 2011. And we're going to get to the first trial in the first quarter of 2018, six and a half years after the original discovery, which for the affected patients and their families seems like a long time. 
but in the drug development industry is, is amazingly fast speed to have an on d disease mechanism therapy get to trial. But then the trial itself will take two years, uh, two and a half years to, for the first phase of trial. So yes, it's a long process. Okay. I have another question. Hi, I'm Kaya, and I'd like to know more about the genes you mentioned, particularly what, um, what, do, what level of gene expression do these drugs affect? Does it all target the same level, or is it different uh, for each so gene? So how much can we change the, the expression of an individual gene? And the answer for, uh, for these drugs used in the nervous system is that we can lower every drug that we've attempted we've been able to lower the target, the target product by at least 90% of the original level, which means that uh, we are to dosing most of the cells within the human nervous system. And the beauty to the approach is that it's dose dependent. So we can dose higher levels, lower levels, and dial down the gene. We don't intend to turn the gene off, we just intend to turn it down. In these diseases of aging, the, the individuals have been, their nervous systems have been making the mutant gene product forever, right from, right from birth, and yet it takes 50 years for the disease to start. So we're hoping that if we can just turn it down, that the normal systems for removing the, da the mutant gene product will now catch back up. Okay, another question. Hi, Dr. Cleveland. My name is Michaela Richardson, and I was wondering, I have two questions, actually. Um, the first one, I was wondering, um, after long-term um, usage of a drug that you've designed, do you think that it's possible that the genes would mutate to adapt to that drug? And what would you do to, okay. to re-counter that? Okay, after long-term administration, if we can really suppress a gene long-term, will we, will we induce mutations in those genes? We think absolutely not. And the reason, uh, in part, because we're aiming at nervous system disease, very few cells in the nervous system are replicating. So uh, we just don't think that it's likely that we're, go that we that we're going to drive any, any aspect of, 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 of mutagenesis. Now, having said that, this is biology. <laughs> and uh, the, anyone who says they know the answers uh, in biology and in medicine Without uh, attempt, without actually doing the, the experiment, well, uh, but we have no reason to think, uh, based on uh, work with uh, cell cultures, work with animals, and the current and the the initial experience in humans, we have no reason to think that that these uh, these kinds of drugs will be will be mutagenic. Okay. And one Thank more question. You. Yes, sir. Um, so Parkinson's and ALS have really um, sometimes similar characteristics or traits. Um, are you finding any overlay in genes that are similar in both patients and both diseases? So in Parkinson's and ALS, is there an overlap of the genes that are really driving disease? No. At least from the genetics, no. So the, uh, the underlying degenerative processes are, in my view, not everybody's view. So again, one of the things, uh, if I would counsel uh, students, is that if you think that there's a uni single m mind about most of these medical questions, that's just not true. But in my view, no, there's, there, there's little similarity in the underlying degenerative process except that when, you di when a, a neuron dysfunctions, and then you lose, the individual loses the, what that neuron does. Yeah, the, the corresponding mm -hmm. trait, yeah. uh, a phenotype then appears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank very, you. Very interesting. And this topic is, uh, is so complex. You hinted at something earlier that I think is very important to talk about, the complexity of the U.S. healthcare system. And of course, uh, when you're talking about uh, research to develop drugs. This is very expensive over a very long period of time. And the United States in our current uh, system right now absorbs an enormous amount of the cost for the development of, of drugs. But as you know, um, this is, is really uh, a controversial issue. This is something that many people believe that the United States uh, should as quickly as possible uh, adopt a system similar to the rest of most of the developed world to have uh, single-payer health care where everyone is able to have health care uh, 
Tell me about your thoughts on this. Uh, obviously, with various insurance plans in the United States, um, I assume that some people without a change in the system would be shut out of certain advancements in medicine, as has been the case forever. Yes, you're, you're, and the one word that I would completely agree with you that you used there was, uh, this is controversial, uh, the, but the American healthcare system uh, and the way in which drug pricing is set, I'm, I'm really, uh, if you really know how it's done, I don't, con I don't see how people who, who, uh, who lean to the right or people who lean to the left, I don't see how anybody can agree that the system that we use now makes any sense at all. So the drug prices are set uh, in part by what will our insurers willing to pay and at not really what cost recovery is needed to drive the, the therapy advance. It, at least that's my opinion. So I, I think the United States really needs to take, uh, I wish we could come together right and left and try to and admit that it's a slightly crazy system and that we really need, but we, ne we need to change, we need sanity. And the truth is that the, uh, the American taxpayer pays a very substantial proportion of the cost of medical research in this country. The pharmaceutical companies have been paying less and less and less over the last 20 years, and now it's the National Institutes of Health and the support of scientists like those here at New Mexico State or at the University of California who are making the discoveries that the pharmaceutical industry now takes to trial, and then the Americans pay the highest cost for those drugs worldwide. So, the Americans pay twice. They pay for the research, and then they pay uh, the, the, the costs again of with the highest drug prices. I, I, I just think independent of where you sit politically, we, we really ought to do be a, a better job of that. Yeah, and of course, uh, the thing that we often hear, uh, unfortunately, about our, our system is that we pay the most, but uh, our, <laughs> our results are not uh, indicative of that. We, we simply do not have, uh, you know, in, in many different measures, the highest performance yeah. of our healthcare system. Yeah, we certainly do not have the highest performance because, as you indicated, uh, there, there are several uh, uh, countries that, that have universal health care, which in my view, uh, for certainly like, like the French one, where they pay per capita half the cost we pay for overall health care, but they cover everybody. And so it's like, it's, uh, and, and they do so with really high quality care. So we, our system has evolved, but I don't think it's been planned. And uh, we, we really owe it to ourselves to think again about how can we do this? How can we provide high quality health care broadly at an affordable cost? Absolutely. We have another question. Yes, so um, could you elaborate a little bit more about the uh, ALS therapy? So a little bit more about the ALS therapies. Uh, so we, we are, uh, the, there's one in trial for the original uh, genetic cause, the first genetic cause of the disease, which was mutations in a gene called superoxide dismutase. We know that we can slow disease course in animals. It's in trial to see if we can slow it in people. We do not know uh, today whether we've been successful. Uh, we do know that we can lower the synthesis of the gene within the human nervous system, so we're optimistic, but we don't know. The, the trial that we have the most uh, excitement over is the one about to start, where we're going to target the gene that causes the most, uh, the, the highest proportion of inherited ALS as well as the highest proportion of uh, uh, frontal temporal dementia. And there, we know we can target the, the bad part of the gene without lowering what the gene normally does. This is, the, this is almost the ideal situation for a gene silencing uh, approach. And so again, I offer optimism, but optimism in clinical practice, uh, you know, it has to be mitigated by, you have to prove that you, that you can really do it. You know, I was so thrilled when you agreed to do this discussion, and it got me looking online for all sorts of information about genetic research and the benefits of learning more about DNA. And we've, up to this point, mainly talked about developing uh, drugs uh, that uh, will deal uh, with various ailments, uh, diseases. Uh, but 
Another benefit that I was reading about that I wanted to give you a chance to talk about um, is the fact that uh, many people are studying uh, how to use DNA information to decide how to prescribe existing drugs for people. Maybe uh, Lipitor will work better for yeah. you if you need to lower your cholesterol than Lovastatin or another uh, drug. Uh, that's just one example, and I was reading about a Mayo Clinic study on this, but I know there are many. G give us some insight into that, the importance of this, because there are so many drugs, and very often uh, it's not customized. You're just yeah. given by your doctor, take this one, let's see how it yeah. does. Yeah, so in indeed, you are right. That is how we have practiced medicine. That's how we've had to practice medicine uh, up till now. So now with the, uh, the explosion in the ability to sequence the, our genomes, now we can identify in the examples you outlined, but even more so, in, for example, in, uh, to, in cancer examples, what really went wrong and what, how did the genome get reorganized in that specific cancer? And by doing that, you can identify individuals uh, at therapies that can be effective in those individuals but won't be effective in other individuals with the same cancer. So I think that kind of personalized medicine, that's almost upon us. It's, it is upon us in selected places, but it will, in, in our lifetime, so we're going to see it ex used much more broadly where, yes, instead of saying, well, this works in a third of the patients, just let's try it in 100% in, in of the patients that have the genetic errors for which the therapy is designed. Okay. Absolutely. Another question. So for Alzheimer's, there are multiple uh, papers going around saying that it can actually be reversed, particularly in early onset. Um, and I'm assuming that if you don't have the three copies, if you just have the normal two copies, um, it would definitely make a difference with this treatment. So would it be, could it be used in tandem with other treatments? So all of these therapies will be used in tandem with other, other treatments, 100%. There will never be in human medical practice a single, uh, a single approach that will be unif uniformly successful across the, uh, the patient pool. But the, with, with regard to Alzheimer's disease, yes, the, the examples of individuals who inherit three copies of a gene for the amyloid precursor protein gene, there's only a handful of those people worldwide, but they do develop early onset Alzheimer's disease. You can, we can be virtually certain of that. And for the rest of us who inherit two good copies of the gene, yes, the strategy would be maybe if we can lower the synthesis of that, maybe that could be uh, a real therapy. The examples of using drugs to, uh, in early onset uh, patients or early disease course patients and really slowing disease advance, no, that's been proposed repeatedly. That's not been de demonstrated ever yet. That's one of the great, uh, there, there have been several spectacularly failed trials uh, that did that. Lilly had one last Thanksgiving. They, they lost their billion dollars. The trial completely failed. There are two now ongoing in Alzheimer's disease using antibody-mediated therapy for which the optimists will be highly optimistic and the pessimists will be continued pessimistic. And we, 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 we just have to wait to see will, who will really be successful. And I, I'm just confident no one approach will be good enough. I'm so glad that the students had questions about uh, Alzheimer's disease because it's one of the things I wanted to ask you about uh, in relation to a larger issue. As you know, we have a rapidly aging society in the United States. So now more than ever, it is incredibly important for medical research to deal with diseases of aging. Yeah. Do you have hope that uh, this enormous need that we have will generate public sentiment, will generate activism among scientists as well to ensure that we have the research dollars and perhaps even a change in our healthcare system to as quickly as possible get to this, this issue. This is, some people believe this is going to be the crisis of the next decades before us. You're certainly right, uh, Fred, that uh, 
it, it, is, it is a looming problem for all of the developed countries where as we have an aging population, the incidence, are, especially of Alzheimer's disease, is going to be a major, a, a major uh, issue, not just for the affected individuals, not just for their families, but for the societies and how we're going to pay for the care for those individuals. So I would, uh, I would certainly be one of those uh, strong, vo strong voices to argue that we cannot afford not to invest. The amount, the dollars that we put in versus what we pay for health care for the affected individuals, there's a pittance of what we put in. So we, we really, we, 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 we just can't afford to sell ourselves short that way. And I did say earlier that I was a hopeless optimist. <laughs> But now with the current American political situation, all right, that my optimism is eroding. And so do I see how we're going to generate the kind of level of enthusiasm that might be needed for the kind of push that you've described, uh, w recognizing the looming uh, a crisis that, may, that, that, may, that is likely to, to appear? I don't see that solution in the short term. But I, but I do have underlying optimism that uh, the, the fractured uh, politics, uh, the, the divide between the Republicans and the, the Democrats, I do think that we can come back together uh, after a, 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 a period of, uh, of dissonance where we can get Americans of all persuasions to build a great America. And a great America has to be one where we have a truly functional health care system where Americans of all walks, rich and poor, get high quality health care. You, you must have had seen some glimmer of hope. Uh, I want to ask you specifically about the fact that uh, we don't normally think of, of scientists as activists, but we did have in Las Cruces a march for science, yeah. and there were marches for science all over the United States, and for that matter, all over the world, when there was a feeling among some that science was under threat, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I mean, there is, a, there is a broad feeling among scientists that science is under threat, where, uh, the, uh, where there are those who, who argue that you just can't believe your lying thermometer, that the world's <laughs> not getting warmer as all the ice is melting. Uh, but, uh, in, but, uh, but in one ray of optimism, uh, our, we do not have a budget yet this year, real, really, but the administration proposed a large cut in the NIH budget when it first came to power. But uh, the Republicans have stepped up in the Congress to uh, remove most of those large cuts. So I do think that we have a reason for s that, that there will be some uh, thoughtful process moving forward. We will not step uh, hugely backward in our commitment to science that, the, that uh, Republicans and Democrats will come together on that, and that the, the there will be there will we won't have the new uh, the, the the new launch of science in 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 this administration, but we also won't have a draconian cut. Okay, very important stuff, and you know something that I feel very passionately about, as you can imagine, working in media. Uh, to be able to inform people, because uh, even when there aren't uh, specific events that occur or reactions to those events, yeah. like marches for science, yeah. I believe, and I'm sure you do too, that it's very important to have an informed discussion and wide availability for that information to make sure that people put information in context. One of the most interesting things, and I want to close the discussion about money with this, is that uh, in this country, uh, every uh, year uh, over the last uh, many years, we have spent uh, more of our discretionary money on the defense budget, yeah. as an example. Uh, it's now in, in the neighborhood of $700 billion per year. I mention this because I think as you would agree, I'm sure, in science and in media, we need context. Yes. $700 billion a year in one year of discretionary spending, our biggest expense for military. Uh, how does this compare when we talk about 
funding medical research. So biomedical research is in uh, about 30 billion. <laughs> so it's about 1 25th of the, uh, that budget. And so I would argue. Uh, but it's actually, never talked about on the news, uh, right? I mean, almost never. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd prefer to say we as a country, we, c we have been the world leader in biomedical research for the last 40 years. Well, we made investments under Republican presidents. We made investments under Democratic presidents. We became the number one in science worldwide. We still are number one, but we have not, uh, we have not made that, renewed that commitment to remain number one. And we can absolutely do so, as you say, with, without, uh, without saying the military doesn't deserve their 700 million. But if you billion, made the right? NIH <laughs> billion, billion, if you made the, uh, the NIH budget 35 billion, you just couldn't notice in the overall U U.S. budget. So the idea of a 13% of a, a cut in the NIH budget, which was first proposed this year, uh, the, that was like, that's, that's a recipe for becoming, becoming sec second tier in world science. And we really should be, we should be proud that we're number one. We should be proud that we drive biomedical research worldwide. And we should continue that investment. That, that I think, is how to make um, and maintain America as the, as the leader in science in the world. Yeah, and it, and it has so many benefits. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to imagine, and, and this is part of why I bring up that context, because very often we don't talk about these issues in the broad scheme yeah. of things, and it's so important to do. You know, uh, as, we, as we close down on an hour of discussion, I would be remiss in not mentioning that you're a member of the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. Cancer touches a lot of people's lives in this country. Tell me about uh, your hopes for the use of DNA research in cancer treatment and perhaps prevention. Okay, so I'm going to tell you an example which uh, the, the, there are some who say, well, Don, you're in this Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. You've been a member of it since 1995. What are you doing working on these nervous system diseases? And the answer is we've developed this strategy of using designer DNA drugs. We've shown that, they're, you, that they are taken up by cells throughout the nervous system and now. And we've demonstrated that they're very long-lived drugs so that they have efficacy f on the scale of months from, so the, actually, and it is really true, and I'm glad to close with this. Uh, we now are attempting uh, very seriously, we're going to use that approach to develop a therapy for the cancer of the nervous system, the cancer, it's called gl glioblastoma. It's invariably fatal. Uh, Ted Kennedy did, died from it. Uh, 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 the Senator McCain S Senator also McCain, has Senator McCain ha ha has an a has is said to have that disease. It's almost invariably f uh, fa fatal disease. It's the most broad cancer of the nervous system by far, and we're going to use these designer DNA drugs to silence genes that allow s those cells to replicate. They go un they have this un uncontrolled replication, and they just fill up the brain with these. Uh, Glial, glial cells uh, with, uh, with that, ha that have escaped normal growth control. And so we're going to exploit the, the development of these DNA-based drugs to now turn them to, a, to an, a, a therapy for glioblastoma. And I hope if I ever get invited back here, I'll be able to tell you that we've m really made progress on that front. It's wonderful to think about that, to think about progress. I want to ask you uh, about another issue that invariably comes up when we talk about DNA, and I, and I think it's important. Um, how concerned, in your view, should we be about the privacy of this information as more and more people uh, voluntarily say, I, I want to know more, I want to know more about my DNA. Some fear, for instance, of course, that it could be used to deny someone a job if they know yes. about their potential to have a disease. It could be used to deny insurance coverage, etc. What are your thoughts about this? So I, I, you're, you're completely correct, Fred, in that, and Americans have every reason to be worried. So the, one, one of the things that the, that the uh, Affordable Care Act had done Obamacare had done was to uh, ensure that 
pre-existing conditions did not, uh, did not limit you from getting insurance in the future. But we discussed uh, the idea earlier, should you get uh, tested for whether you have one of these disease-causing mutations? And in the, current, uh, in the current American environment of uncertainty about the fate of Ob Obamacare and whether uh, uh, pre-existing conditions will be covered, if you know, you may never be covered. So that, and that's one of the major differences between the United States and many of the countries of Northern Europe where you know you're going to be covered and those individuals then seek to know and many Americans, it is a, it, that's one of the things you want to you consider very carefully in that genetic counseling. It, do you really want to know? Because it could have very serious consequences it, to, to know the, not just that you know the answer is yes and that you're probably going to uh, develop the disease, but for all of your economic, uh, ec economic uh, position moving forward. Yeah. You know, in mentioning the Affordable Care Act, and it relates directly to these uh, cutting edge treatments, one of the things that is rarely discussed in, in media uh, about the Affordable Care Act, and, and it's essential that people understand it as we continue this health care discussion where changes are, uh, some have been made, some may be coming. Uh, one of the other ch huge changes in the Affordable Care Act often not mentioned is uh, that many insurance plans before the Affordable Care Act had lifetime limits. Yes, indeed. Can you talk about that? I mean, this is so important for people to understand. I mean, you, you, you may have look at an insurance policy and see, oh, the lifetime limit's two million or three million, I'll never get there. Not the case when you have cancer or when you have some of these these diseases that we may yeah. see advancements in. Yeah, so I, I, you are, you are, I think, I am agree I'm in, in agreement with you that we have not discussed uh, publicly uh, and cogently the, some of the huge benefits of the Affordable Care Act that, are, that in the current plan being put forward that are now uh, removed. The, uh, the lifetime cap and the idea about afford, uh, that, that you could not be that you could not be penalized for uh, a pre-existing condition. And the current plan that's been, or plans that have been put forward, there was a huge penalty yeah. for, in a, it, you can, it, the administration said, well, there was no, they did, did not eliminate pre-existing conditions, but they did because they allowed uh, uh, unlimited charges, which most individuals would not be, could, could, could never afford. So the, uh, the, whether we can afford American health care because we deliver it in such, in such an expensive way, I, I, that's, that's a true debate that we all can participate in. But whether we want to, whether we should be able to offer health care broadly to the population at an affordable price to covering pre-existing conditions, I, I, I do think, I'm, and I, I agree with uh, your point of view, that really a great country has to be able to do that. And the world's richest country has to be able to afford that. It just can't be true that we cannot afford that. Yeah, it's so incredibly important. We just have a few minutes left, and as is often the case with science, uh, you never have enough time. We're talking about very <laughs> complex issues. What would you like to leave uh, the students who came today uh, to, to listen, what would you like to leave them with? And what would you like to leave our audience with at home? Because there are two different, two different audiences here. Okay, so for the students, I would say, uh, you know, you're young, you're going to make choices, and I said it before, but I say it again, don't sell yourself short. You can get a great education here at New Mexico State. You can go almost anywhere from New Mexico State. And don't, don't tell yourself that you can't. For the, for the, the more general audience, I, I would say there are really major changes coming uh, in uh, biomedical research and in their application to treating human disease. It really is going to happen. The United States is the world leader in doing that. We as a country should be proud of that. The, the advances uh, are going to, the, the, the advances are going to happen. They're going to happen in our lifetime. We need as a country to decide how can we pay for these. And we can only do that if we have Democrats and Republicans sitting down and 
to, and discussing the potential options and doing so in a true in, in a in a true discussion, not in in bulleted points of half truths. Dr. Don Cleveland of the University of California at San Diego, an NMSU alum. It is such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming today. My pleasure. Thank you at home as well. I'm Fred Martino. Have a great day.